Hello, everybody. Welcome to the International Rental News webinar on cybersecurity in rental and construction. My name is Belinda Smart, and I'm uh, the editor of International Rental News. And it's a great pleasure to welcome you all here today. Um, obviously, cybersecurity is um, hitting the headlines in the wider world, and in particular, in the rental and construction uh, industries. We've had a couple of very high profile um, incidents uh, this year, uh, one in January where a uh, lifting specialist, Pal Finger, was um, quite seriously affected by a ransomware attack. And uh, more recently, we've had Nordic accommodation uh, company, uh, rental company, Adapteo, which uh, also had a breach in September. Um, this is something that is increasingly on the agenda for all businesses and um, no less so in rental and construction. Uh, so it's great to have you here with us today um, to discuss this with three quite eminent um, experts in this space. Um, uh, I just have a, a couple of um, things to um, address first, which is uh, obviously to thank our sponsors, um, MCS and Lawson's Global Recruitment. Um, many thanks for your support. We do greatly appreciate it. Um, and also uh, just a quick point of order in terms of how this uh, webinar will go forward. Um, uh, we're looking at a discussion probably for about half an hour, maybe more, followed by uh, a Q&A um, session. Um, but I would encourage people, uh, attendees, to uh, direct their questions to the panelists throughout the webinar. Um, you'll see at the bottom of your Zoom screen um, that there's a Q&A box. Um, so if you could please uh, use that to um, comment or ask questions, do please specify if you want to uh, speak to a particular um, member of the panel or if, you, if it's an open question, that's absolutely fine. And we will um, try our best to get through all the questions as we go forward. Um, so um, without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our panelists. So if you could possibly reveal yourselves, please, um, our experts. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, so with us um, this afternoon, uh, today, I should say, we have um, Alexander Verndel eich riedler um, who is Vice President, Global ICT and Global Business Services at Palfinger. Um, we also have Guy Dolberger, who is um, Vice President, Information Security at Richie Bross. Um, Guy is a self-described former ethical hacker, so he has very in-depth uh, knowledge of this space, um, and he's worked in uh, public and private organizations and across a variety of sectors uh, in cybersecurity for almost 20 years. So thank you very much for joining us, Guy. And uh, we also have with us, um, with great pleasure, Gareth Lloyd, uh, Chief Digital and Information Officer at Loxam Powered Access, and he is a member of the um, European Rental Association Cybersecurity Working Group as well. Um, Guy, don't forget to unmute, please. So you're on mute at the moment. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I mentioned earlier, um, perhaps we could start with you, Alex. Um, obviously, the Palfinger incident in January was, was a, a, a quite a wake-up call for um, your business. Um, I, I understand it, it did... Um, things sort of uh, had to cease operations for a, a, about a week in various sites internationally. Um, can you just maybe tell us what happened? Uh, Balfinger was a victim of a ransomware attack uh, beginning of uh, or end of January, starting with the 23rd or 24th, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. And then it lasted a lot, approximately 12 uh, calendar days until we brought back the business online and to resume production again. Mm. Uh, it was affected the whole group of companies. So there was basically a complete shutdown of the whole production and also administrative processes due to this ransomware attack. Mm. 
Um, well, it'd be very interesting to hear how you dealt with it and, you know, the insights you've, you've gathered since that time. Um, uh, Guy, um, perhaps you could um, just introduce yourselves, yourself to us and, um, you know, give us an insight into your experience in this space and what you're doing at Richie Bross. Sure. Thanks, uh, Belinda. Thanks for having me. <clears throat> um, so, yeah, I've, I've been doing this for what feels like forever, so about uh, you know 18 to 20 years. Uh, been in different industries from uh, uh, healthcare to financial industries uh, to tech, and now finally uh, construction. So uh, it's interesting because you do see different types of attacks depending on the industry, but uh, there's sort of like this overarching um, similarities, right? Where ransomware doesn't discriminate, right? It attacks every single industry, every single sector, just because how lucrative and how easy it is to um, uh, to manage. Mm. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think for, for Richie Brothers specifically, you know, I'm heading their um, information security uh, and data privacy. Um, we have a fairly small team, but uh, you know, we're, we're very well structured. We use a lot of automation. We've invested a lot in uh, latest and greatest technologies. Yeah, okay. Uh, well, but, you know, we obviously conduct security awareness training, things like that. Yes. Okay. Um, we can look at um, you know some of the solutions that um, people are implementing. Um, uh, but Gareth, perhaps you could um, just introduce yourself. Um, I, I have spoken to you about this before, and obviously um, you did um, tell me that there was quite a frightening um, incident in 2017 at Loxham Powered Access, and that was really a bit of a wake up call for your business. Can you maybe um, talk our audience through that? Well, yeah, as we've heard, every every uh, business out there is subject to attempted cyber attacks every day. Mm. Um, and it's, uh, it's just a matter of course. And almost all the time, um, they get caught, intercepted by one of the layers of security that, uh, that we've all got in place. And so the incident that you're referring to back in 2017 was, it was still just an attempt. We didn't lose any money. We didn't lose any data but it got close enough to that being uh, realized and um, mm. that it really got um, the attention of the executive team and it put cybersecurity as like a board level topic really for the first time. Yeah. And I think sometimes you do need those wake up calls, those moments of realization to, uh, to get everybody aligned. And mm. that's certainly what happened for us. And in that instance, I think it was a phishing incident, was it? It was to do with um, targeted emails. Um, was, was that right? Absolutely bog standard. Yeah, phishing email targeted at our purchase ledger. Mm. So um, no, uh, no, nothing special, nothing special about it at all. It's just um, sometimes these things get further than um, you, you might want them to. Yeah, um, but uh, crisis was averted, it sounds like. So any, anyway, um, uh, maybe we can revert just but just go back to Alex because your 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 incident was uh, the most recent. Um, can you uh, maybe um, give our our audience an idea of you know how that's changed Powerfinger's approach to cybersecurity? Um, uh, you know if, if there's new measures you've implemented. I think the strategy itself that we had stayed the same, so there's not much change from the content perspective. Mm -hmm. But as already mentioned, uh, it was a kind of a wake-up call also for senior management. And now, more or less money does not play a crucial role with respect to cybersecurity. So uh, whatever measure we need to implement from a systems perspective or, so, or from a resource perspective, we basically can do. Um, the issue on the resource perspective, meaning finding people, is rather how quickly you find them. As everyone knows, talent of war. Um, is on its way and it's rather difficult to find cyber experts in this field and uh, we usually need six to eight months or 12 months to hire corresponding network technicians, active, active directory specialists and all these kind of things. But from mm -hmm. that on, uh, we now made a RFQ process for a security operations center that's now been decided. And the next step is to basically bring the security operation center up and running. We implemented uh, EDR technology, endpoint detection and response. We focused on DNS security. We reviewed and are still reviewing our uh, privileged account management uh, concepts and uh, 
more or less nailing down the high level uh, or high privileged accounts to a reasonable amount mm. uh, or try to avoid them in general. So that's more or less the way we are going to currently at the moment. Mm. So, so you've, uh, am I right in thinking you've, uh, you, you, you've done this internally, you're, you didn't appoint a third party consultancy or you've, um, you've, you're building up a team internally at, at Palfinger? Both. 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 Okay. Uh, basically, mm. I think Palfinger from its size with uh, 11,000 employees and from the technology stack, we, um, we do need to run that business or to run that cybersecurity landscape would mm -hmm. be too small to run that on a 24-7 basis. Mm -hmm. So we do the uh, management of the outsourcing partners internally, but the operations of this uh, security operation center and all these kinds of things are done by external partners. We, okay. do pre we do prepare the RFQ documents. We do understand the technology. We do understand the concepts. We negotiate with the partners together with our procurement department. But the actual operations is then done by a different variety of partners, mm -hmm. but we steer those partners. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, the, the smaller you are, I think you cannot rely on a security team because it would be probably too big to do it on a 24-7 basis, especially mm -hmm. with the really broad technology, technology stake you have uh, to run such a security operation center and cybersecurity in general. Mm. You're, both the other panelists are, are nodding. There is that. Is that um, would, would you agree with that, um, Guy? That that approach that you can't, um, uh, you know, re rely totally on a, a, a vertical internal response. Yeah, I, I agree. It's been increasingly difficult to to hire the right people. Um, but I think another thing that 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 helps is. You know, maybe not trying to solve all the problems, uh, maybe hiring somebody with potential. I found a lot of uh, people out there come in uh, with the right attitude and the right passion for cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. And typically, or you might see people that, that used to do like, you know, networking infrastructure come from different, uh, with different tech abilities. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you can be a good sort of like leader and, and mentor, train them, provide the training, um, you know, maybe create some incubator in your local uh, towns to you know attract talent and train them. Uh, I think that could help our industry, and, and it can yeah. help us bring in you know and and train the right talent yeah. in house. But but yeah, it, it is it is difficult mm. today. Yeah, it's a bit of a process to hire people. And you're finding that too, Gareth, in terms of getting the right skills um, on board. I I think of it um, similar to the rest of the the rest of the teams that I'm responsible for. So. Um, we don't have the scale to do everything in-house. It would be crazy to try and do everything in-house. We work with a range of partners, so mm -hmm. um, managed services. So we've used the example there of a 24-7 SOC um, that Alex was talking about, and that's uh, exactly the type of situation where you're much better off working with a third party than mm -hmm. having the expense yeah. of doing that um, uh, internally. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it's that hybrid um, approach that you've, we've all got to take. I don't think there's any other option. Yeah. Uh, I've actually got some questions coming in, which is great. Um, um, the first one is about ransomware. Uh, and I, I understand that this, this particular form of attack is sort of on the rise, but uh, this questioner has asked, uh, what are the best tools that we can implement in order to stop ransomware attacks? So um, I don't know if, if any of you wants to kick off, uh, is perhaps, uh, yeah, any of you, Guy? <laughs> sure, sure. Um, you know, I think with, with ransomware specifically, uh, we see a lot of it comes in uh, typically through email. That That's the quickest entry point just because they can just send it to a lot of people. So investing in, in probably email security uh, and some awareness training for the users on you know, how to mm -hmm. manage these, these emails coming in, you know, the typical things, don't click on something that looks suspicious. Uh, but investing in some, there's some good technology out there, um, you know, and I don't want to name any specific vendors, but you mm. know, I can, people, people can reach out to me after if they want to, but, mm -hmm. but the specific vendors that are really good, uh, you know, they, they invested in email security where they can stop um, a big chunk of these emails if they're known bad. Mm. Uh, the, second, the second thing is just having good backup and disaster recovery strategy, uh, making sure that you also test them, right? Um, we also gone through the exercise of doing a tabletop uh, where we simulate, you know, a ransomware 
attack and we say, look, if this happened today, how are we going to handle that? And that's typically mm -hmm. when you get a lot of aha moments, right? <laughs> Where you realize, mm -hmm. oh shoot, we thought that this was working on, we just assumed that we can call this person and they're going to step in and help us. So, so I think going through the process, just 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 go through the process saying, okay, let's let's just pretend that it's happening. We mm -hmm. walked into the office today, everything is down. It sounds scary, but but what do we do? Let, let's let's unpack mm -hmm. that and let's start thinking about, yeah. you know, do we have all the right numbers who to call? Uh, do we have the right detection protection tools in place, and do we have the backup and recovery strategy on, to deal with this? Mm. Yeah. So, so that, that you have had your aha moments where you've sort of realized that um, perhaps some of your strategies. I mean, uh, is it literally a case? I mean, if you're a, a rental company suddenly or a construction equipment company you suddenly realize that you're under attack, what what is the best way to respond? Um, uh, I, I guess it depends on the nature of the attack, but um, um gareth what's what's your take on that well it's it's the old scout motto isn't it it's be prepared so we you know guy was just talking about ransomware and the importance of um having your pro a proper backup strategy and the segregation of that from your main network etc mm. um so in in the case of an incident it's have you got your incident your 24 or 72 hour incident response plan in place do you know what you're going to do do you know mm. who you're going to contact um, yeah. It will depend on the particular type of attack that comes through, but it's all about the um, the preparation and response. And quite often, it's about identifying things as early as you can. It could be an unusual pattern of um, tickets through your service desk. Mm -hmm. um, it could be you know just some just something anomalous that you that you happen to see, and that's where um, a seam um, solution like we we use Splunk um, and a SOC security mm -hmm. operations center um, with hourly checks in place can really help you um, intercept things early mm. um, and get ahead of the game so i yeah. think that's the uh, um i think that's the approach for me is be prepared yes um alexander did you want to add anything to that or i, I think it's it's not a, just a matter of which tool you can implement it's always a matter of people technology and, and processes Mm -hmm. And they need to be interlinked together in order mm -hmm. to stop or prevent those uh, items. And especially in the case of uh, ransomware attacks, I think it's a multitude of tools and processes and technologies that you need to involve in order to prevent those. Mm -hmm. um, as soon as you are hit by a ransomware attack, from my personal experience, I think there is honestly speaking no way around to uh pay the ransom in case it's in a reasonable range because really? otherwise, otherwise you would lose probably so much data and need to call your customers and uh, uh vendors uh, to uh, inform them that they have to ignore probably orders because mm. you hardly have a backup which is close to real time and the time difference between your last backup and the time different and the time the ransomware hit you the data is usually lost so you're you're sorry just to clarify you're you're saying that in some instances you would have to pay the ransom yes i and think that, honest mm. honestly speaking there is no way around it and what what about our other panelists? Uh, I mean, that, that's quite that's quite a dramatic revelation in a way. I mean, I, uh, you know, I've never really asked. I was actually going to ask that question, but um, Guy Gareth, do, do you think that's um, a fair assessment of of how how you would react to a ransomware incident? Um, well, I think there are there are there are laws in in certain countries around not paying um, paying those ransoms. Um, I think it's quite common that people do pay. Mm. Um, I know the official the official advice, certainly in the UK, is is not to make those not to make those payments. Mm. Um, but it just goes to prove what a great business model it is. Um, cybercrime is a fantastic business model. Um, it's really cheap um, for these guys to um, pick up um, tools. It's really cheap for them to execute attacks. Uh, very low risk of getting caught and a decent chance of getting a nice uh, a nice payoff so it's it's a really good mi business model for them and mm. um so sometimes you know an economically rational thing to do as alex is saying is uh, 
is to make the payment. Mm. Um, yeah, that's a sobering thought. Um, I've just um, had a question here about um, frequency of attacks. Um, I mean, I think this is a general question, not just about ransomware, but um, I mean, could you um, put a, a sort of a figure on maybe, you know, how many near misses or how many attacks um, you have in, in your business at, at any given time and whether this is sort of um, going up or or, or, or you know, whether it's accelerating. Guy, um, perhaps you could um, talk to us about that. Is it a daily yeah, occurrence sure. or...? Oh, yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's definitely a daily occurrence. I mean, we, we do see, especially when you bring tools like EDR, endpoint detection and response, you, you know, and especially uh, after COVID because people are now logged in from anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not like before when they came into the office and, you know, you can, you can see most of the traffic from the office. Like now you see traffic from, from everywhere, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, I mean, even when people travel and they go on, you know, to an airport or, you know, they just go to a friend's house, um, you do see pretty interesting attempts. Mm -hmm. um, I, th I think, you know, we kind of got to the point where we have a lot of automation in place where we're not really worried about, um, you know, just random alerts that come in if they get blocked. Uh, we're worried more about, um, you know, is there a pattern here? Is there a trend uh, mm. that we see particular? And, and we do have, um, you know, our SOC also has threat intelligence. So we do have a threat intelligence tool where we try to figure out, okay, has this been seen anywhere out in other industries? Because if, if it has, we'll be more concerned about that, right? And we want to dig in a little deeper to mm. see if these people are trying to prep. Because typically there is a methodology, believe it or not, to a lot of these hackers so they go through these, these various steps and the step one is reconnaissance, right? Like they want to gather as much information. Mm -hmm. uh, during that phase, typically they don't do anything disruptive, that, right? They just, you see them poking around, trying to get more and more like lateral movement into different uh, systems. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you can catch it early on, like that's why discovery is important. If you can catch it early on, you want to look at the trends. You want to, you want to figure out, are they planning something, right? And try to catch it early on. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, um... Uh, we've also talked about um, user awareness and, and employee awareness as, as part of the sort of mix of, of um, dealing with this issue. Um, uh, what are the, are you finding that there's more sort of understanding in terms of your employees on um, the kinds of routes that attackers um, might take um, uh, to, to, to to, to affect your business? Um, and if so, is that because of, um, you know, are, are you implementing sort of training on a regular basis for your, for your staff? Um, Gareth, you're nodding. Um, yeah, I think it's, it's hugely important. So people are um, kind of the, we always say they're the weakest link in the, the, the protection that we've got, but they're really, really crucial. And um, so, um, well, one of the reasons why email is so successful as a threat vector is um, it's the person interacting with and clicking on the link. Mm. Um, and uh, so I think awareness raising and, and training is absolutely imperative. Um, so we run, uh, as well as e-learning, uh, annual e-learning for people, um, in in, depending on their roles. We also run lots and lots of simulated phishing. Um, and right. uh, I think that's fantastic in terms of uh, raising people's level of awareness. Mm. Um, and as you see, phishing moving more towards spear phishing, so much more targeted, mm -hmm. um, you can do the same with your simulated phishing. So we tend to do very targeted simulated phishing campaigns as well. So spear um, phishing, just to clarify, that's when you, you target literally one, one individual or, or one cluster of people within a an organization exactly so something that's that's focused purely at the uh, the c-suite or the or the finance team or or even an, as you say as an in, to an individual um, mm. so something much more targeted and just that raising of awareness for everybody is is really crucial and mm. the the um the way we try to articulate it is it's a bit like health and safety mm. so it's it's everybody's responsibility. Um, we all need to take accountability for it. Um, it's not um, directly generating revenue or about customer satisfaction or the things that, you know, as a business we're really focused on, um, but it's as important as health and safety. It's effectively like the online version of that. Mm. Um, and that kind of way of approaching it 
informs how we train people as well. Mm -hmm. um, so there are uh, managers, everybody going through different layers of training and accreditation. And mm -hmm. um, I do think that's that's absolutely the uh, the way to approach it. Yeah. Um, I don't know what the, the other panellists um, think, but that's certainly uh, my experience. Yeah. Alex, um, do you have a view on that, uh, you know, in terms of raising awareness amongst, you know, all your staff uh, as to how to sort of uh, be aware, more aware of, of, of these threats? I think at least how we do it, we are constantly issuing newsletters or articles in our newsletters with respect to cybersecurity. And now they are describing what is the most common measure like CEO fraud mails or CFO fraud or ransomware attacks how they can be seen, how they can be discovered, what should be done uh, in a certain way if they are dealt with uh, from a certain uh, email. And mm -hmm. on the other side, we are constantly, let's say, proving our users if they understand what we are constantly repeating to them. So we do kind of phishing attacks internally mm -hmm. and then uh, present the results to them what would have happened if this would have been real and then oh. try to uh, explain them why they need to be cautious. But oh. it's uh, something I think which you need to do on a constant basis. It's not a one-off effect uh, that you do probably once uh, a year. Uh, we do it, I think, uh, phishing tests we run, I think, once a month in different regions to different users. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, actually, I just had a question for you um, specifically, I think, uh, Alex. Um, I, I'm not sure if I've got this right. It, the question is, do you run your operation in the cloud or on-prem? Does that mean something to you? Yes, it's a mixture. We have a hybrid environment. We run it both on-premise and cloud systems. Oh, on-premise. Okay. Yeah. On-premise and cloud systems. Yes. Okay. Depends on the system. Yeah. Got you. Um, um, I've got a, a more general question from uh, an attendee. I mean, I, this one is probably quite hard to answer in a way, but um, can we perhaps talk about some of the more common ways that cyber criminals are using to attack, particularly the rental and construction sector? Um, there are a few things that spring to mind, especially things like Internet of Things, you know, smart machinery that that um, you know is now increasingly open to these kinds of threats. But um, Gareth, perhaps um, you could address that. Is there any uh, type that's more common than others for, for our sector? Well, I think so. You've, met, you've mentioned a couple question. of things there. So, so mm. e email is is the most common threat vector we've already talked about. IoT mm. attacks are. Um, relatively uncommon at the moment, but should be on the radar of mm -hmm. every rental company um, exec team. Um, and, um, and why I say that is, is everybody's moving their rental fleets to, um, to, be, um, I, uh, to have IoT solutions, so telemetry sensors and um, remote access controls and things. So everybody's doing that. And once you connect a thing, a machine to the internet, mm. you're exposing it to the, the risk of, uh, or to the risks around cybersecurity. Mm. And IoT um, is an area where there is a huge disjoint between the sophistication of the security protection um, on the machine um, and the sophistication of the criminals. Mm -hmm. um, so just to give you a tiny example, right? Um, Every, everybody on this call would take it as a given that we regularly patch laptops, um, servers, phones. Everybody would accept that. Um, mm. Everyone would know that's critical for cybersecurity. And mm. yet 99%, I'm guessing, but let's say 99% of the IoT devices out there that we use it's impossible to patch the software or firmware on them. Impossible. Uh -huh. You can't do it over the air. You can't do it when they're back at base. You literally have to replace the device. Right. Um, so there is a, a very limited um, level of uh, protection um, and a very uh, an increasing level of sophistication for the cyber criminals. And it's really easy to see where that imbalance in the arms race takes you. Mm -hmm. um, so it could be as simple as, some, as somebody using, 
your machines as a soft backdoor into the rest of your network. Mm-hmm. But it, it could be it could be something much more nefarious. It could be somebody altering the um, se- safety settings on a machine mm. through controlling the CAN, mm. the controller area network. It could be somebody conducting a kind of like ransomware attack where they yeah. disable your machines. Mm. Um, so there's a, a big issue for us as a sector um, as we go ahead with all the advantages of IoT. Um, mm. Somehow we need to up our game on the security side as well. Mm. Mm. Um, do the other panelists want to add to that, um, Guy or, or Alex, um, just with specific reference to um, smart machines and the IoT? Or, um... Yeah, I would say, you know, treat it as, you know, an unpatched router that you pick up and use at home, right? Like it's like, not for original, but I've seen it before where you run vulnerability scanners Mm -hmm. Uh, And if you run it across everything with an IP address, uh, to Garrett's point, like these things come very unpatched off the box with default passwords. Like it's, it's very, like it's, it's, it's scary how you see like Apple devices or or printers or coffee machines that, that, you know, are smart and have access Mm -hmm. to the internet. Like same as these, these equipment devices now that they're going to start coming out with, um, you know, mini computers attached to them. I think segregation and then, having the ability to run regular vulnerability scanning on mm-hmm. these machines will at least give you the, the insights, but I would never, I'll also argue that I've never put it on the same segment as your, as your network. That's, that's probably number one, if you have okay. the ability to do so. Yeah. Mm. And Alex, did you want to add anything to that or? Um, I think the times where you have CEO or CFO for old males that are really doing harm to a company, they are gone more or less uh, the users are rare and you have possibilities to recognize them. What I would see is that ransomware attacks will be around for the next, I would say, two to three years still Mm -hmm. uh, and might be very vulnerable to a lot of companies until they have uh, implemented preventive measures. And as already mentioned by Gareth and Guy, for the future landscape, uh, IoT attacks or on those machines are probably on their way. Mm, mm. Uh, but probably the outcome might be a little bit different if you for example assume that the crane which can be controlled remotely uh, is taken over by an IoT device and then uh, an attacker can move the load around how it wants to be and and lift it off where he wants to be probably people are people's life are in danger so uh, you need to be very cautious there and that's a real threat Yeah. yeah You need to test uh, quite a frightening scenario. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, um, I've had some uh, great feedback on, on um, the Q and A. Um, great panel. So much expertise between you. Um, question for the uh, the panel in general: When it comes to cybersecurity, are there particular differences, dynamics for rental businesses than other types of businesses in our industry? Uh, for example, um, contractors, OEMs, or service providers. So, you know, is there something um, very specific to rental that um, uh, we should be aware of? I, I guess some, um, you know, complex supply chains might be one of them. Um, but um, is that something? Um, perhaps, perhaps Gareth, you could you could have a stab at that one. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we, we've talked about the. Um, kind of the, the OEM side of it with IoT, because that's ultimately mm. where that sits. But the, the other side um, is, is equally interesting, so the customer side. Mm. Uh, so there's an awful lot of potential um, for um, us to be attacked because of our customer base. Mm-hmm. So people in, in rental, um, maybe a few years ago, maybe not so much now, would say, you know, we're low profile. Why, why would we be a target? Well. We might be low profile, like kind of most cyber criminals don't care about that, They're looking for soft targets. Mm. Um, but if they are um, uh, targeting a particular entity, it could well be one of our large customers, part mm. of the cr- critical national infrastructure, somebody who is in utilities or telco or um, Ukrainian power plants or, or Iranian nuclear facilities or whatever, whatever it may be. We mm-hmm. could be a very easy route into those organizations. 
Mm. Mm. Um, and so we need to, and obviously the reputational damage of 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 being the um, Trojan horse um, that gets uh, gets a criminal, a cyber criminal inside one of our customers. Um, that's a that's a huge reputational threat for us. Mm. So mm. we need to think about it not in the context just of ourselves, mm. but our customers as well as our suppliers. Mm. Um, so it's it's really thinking about the whole end to end piece there. And how how might you actually go about that? I mean, how might you go about engaging, you know, all the sort of players in your supply chain, both upstream and downstream, um, to ensure you're sort of all singing from the same hymn sheet, as it were? Um, uh, I'll start, well, carry on, Gareth, but I'm sure the other panellists might want to add something. But um, are there, what what would the process be, or what what process have you deployed at, at Locksound to, to to do that to bring everyone into this uh, discussion? It's it's the absolute norm now for um, all our customers and all our engagements with major suppliers that there's fairly detailed cybersecurity um, checks and questionnaires as part of the um, procurement process. Mm. So whenever we're pitching for work, it's a big part of what we. Uh, uh, th- might be 30 out of the 120 pages or whatever um, mm. that needs to go back on cybersecurity. And it's the same the other way around. When mm. we're picking suppliers, um, we have the same kind of um, checks and balances in place. Yeah. I think it's just a standard a standard way of operating now. Mm. Um, I've got a sort of related question, which has been directed to, specifically to Guy. Um, Richie obviously has an enormous database of customers around the world. Um, how do you protect that your your customer base? I guess your your customer database, um, guy. Yes, yeah, so, I mean I mean data privacy obviously is a is a huge part, and you know us being global, we have to deal with regulatory compliance, GDPR, CCPA. But um, you know we, it, it's a layered approach. You know we 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 do encryption on on sensitive data. Um, you know, we do access control where, you know, people should only have access to data that they need to on a need to basis. Mm. Um, to get at the point, we do have uh, data privacy agreements and security questionnaires and addendums that, you know, we work closely with our legal team to make sure that, uh, you know, we write those. We also evaluate the controls if we have to share data. Mm. Uh, we have a data subject request uh, process. Mm. Um, to our to our website, so our customers can go in, open up a form, you know, fill out, um, uh, you know, around data privacy, around transparency, if if they want uh, rights to be forgotten, so they can they can request for the data to be erased. So, uh, you know, our customer support group, we work closely with them to ensure that if it is a data related request, that we, you know, within thirty days, we we get back to the customers, ensure that we respect their privacy rights. Uh, mm-hmm. We also implemented the cookie consent management uh, on our on our um, outfacing website. So if somebody goes to the website, they can pick and choose, you know, only required cookies that are required for the site to function properly. But they can, let's say, remove some marketing or targeted type um, mm-hmm. uh, cookies that are on the site. Right. So we we've done quite a lot of work there to to address privacy and uh, respect uh, customers' privacy. Okay, great. Um, Alex, did you want to um, add anything? You know, obviously, um, as a company that's interfacing with the, you know, the, it was part of the rental sector. Is this are there rental specific um, threats? Do you think for this, for in terms of cybersecurity? At the moment, I can't think of any. But uh, mm. even also with our suppliers, if you have an addendum in a contract with respect to cybersecurity and ask them questions and or give them a questionnaire, it's one thing that they have to answer those questions, but still it's just a sheet of paper and nothing else. Mm-hmm. Um, the tougher thing is that you need to regularly basically audit if this is really what they have implemented. Mm-hmm. And then it gets pretty tricky and uh, resource intensive. If, mm-hmm. for example, you have, let's say, uh, 20 suppliers that uh, deliver you just in time and are connected to a network because they have some uh, machines that you run for you, mm-hmm. and you basically need to audit them on a quarterly basis if this is really what they signed in paper is really there. Mm-hmm. So this is uh, uh, a 
cumbersome and resource yeah. intensive task because I just confirming know. something on a sheet of paper is one thing, mm. but the proving that they really have it and live it is the other thing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, um, I have a, a, another question to do with, uh, well, I guess um, um, machines and, um, uh, well, I'll, I'll just read it out. It's um, how vulnerable is telematics? Um, I guess uh, particularly because of the different providers um, that may be involved in, 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 a, in a fleet. Um, now, this person is getting quite technical. We know that most of them are working on AEMP 2.0 protocol, but on the short run, should we ask a security system for the IoT or small machines? Does that make sense to um, the panelists? Yeah, it does, yeah. So the AEMP is a, is a standard for the, for the um, specification around the data that's passed. And I right. think the... The the um, the important or the one of the one of the things that's important around IoT security is is whether you're just pulling data from the machine mm -hmm. or whether you're sending commands to the machine. Okay. So there's oh. a level of obviously there's a level of risk around somebody intercepting data that you're extracting. Um, however, um, if you have uh, a system where you're, for example, uh, sending um, access codes, pins to, um, a, to, to a machine, or um, you can send commands that will change the settings um, in the mm. engine. Um, or in, our, in our world, it could be around the working envelope of a boom lift. Um, if you're able to do those things and send those commands to the machines, that's a whole new level of risk mm. um, that, needs to be, uh, that needs to be considered. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, did the uh, other panelists want to add to that at all? I would agree from that perspective. Getting lots of uh, good questions here. Um, uh, this is, uh, sorry, just jumping about a bit. Um, with, someone's asked a question about um, insurance policies. Uh, what do the panelists feel about taking out insurance policies for cyber attack? Can it be done practically and is it worth it? Um, what about you, Alex? Probably at the moment, it's a bad time to, pay, uh, to purchase an insurance policy uh, against cyber attacks. Since the cyber attacks are rising and the insurance companies are realizing that the premium of the insurance uh, compared to the uh, damage they have to cover is probably not that what they expected. The premiums for the insurance are rising dramatically. That's uh -huh. what it, at least what we observe. And usually, in order to get insured, they uh, impose you with a lot of technical systems that you need to have in place to even get the proper insurance level. So uh -huh. you need to have kind of a technical expertise and stuff and systems in place that you ever get insured. Uh -huh. And as with every insurance contract, I would propose that you read the small letters in the addendum, what is really covered and it was not, and what we put is out of scope and what is in scope. Uh, and if you have done that and I still think that uh, insurance is worth taking it, I think it can help to a certain degree, yes. Mm -hmm. Did you, uh, sorry, did Palfinger have insurance but prior to this incident and, and was it helpful? Um, we had insurance. And if it was helpful, it's still to be proven. Right. Yeah. You're still dealing with the fallout, I suppose. Yeah. Um, yes. um, okay. Uh, I've got another question, um, which is again. Can I just come in on oh, that? Oh, yes. Yeah, uh, absolutely, so, Gareth. Yeah. Um, so I, um, I think it, it's not something that should be decided by an IT security team. It's essentially this is a business continuity and like corporate risk question. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it, it really falls to, to, those, to those people who are responsible for that to make those decisions. For me, I think I, I absolutely think it's um, the way to go. Yes, there are um, a lot of costs and uh, questions around cover um, and exceptions, et cetera, but I think it's, it should be part of everybody's consideration of the um, uh, insurance uh, policies that they're taking out. And the other thing it can, can help with is um, they have panels of um, specialist providers 
who they can give you access to if you do have an incident. So okay. it can be a good way to get early support mm -hmm. and contact, contact the insurer and um, get somebody in to help. And so it's literally, it's literally that, that phone call you make um, in the wake of, of some kind of breach that, uh, you know, it's, it's a first response sort of... Um, exactly, that, that exactly. So peace of mind. Mm. Yeah. 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 So you're not just Googling um, for who can help me with a cyber breach. You're phoning your insurer and they're um, giving you a hotline through to um, a, a specialist third party. Mm -hmm. So I think it can help from that perspective as well. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Um, uh, I've got another question here. Um, it's you know moving away from insurance, but um, uh, it's but back on this subject of um, cloud versus um, on premise. So, do you see a re reduced or increased risk by moving systems to the cloud as opposed to on premise? Um, is that something you would like to kick off with, Guy? Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I always say, um, I mean, there are pros and cons. Obviously, I think I think a lot of these cloud providers do uh, give you the the platform to come baked in with some, uh, you know, some built-in security. But it's ultimately your responsibility. You still have to treat it as a as your own network. You still have to put the segregation in place. You just have to put the firewalls. You have to set up the um, a lot of security. What it, but from a scalability perspective, it, it is more beneficial. Um, it's a lot quicker to recover, right? Because you have uh, different ge geographies, especially if you would you go with uh, big providers, you know, AWS, mm. Microsoft. So, so you're saying it's better to be in the cloud, are you? I, I mean, yes. Now, let's take a crazy example that if you know, if everybody decides to move to the cloud, and then you know, attackers are bringing down AWS tomorrow. Like, let's say there's a massive attack on Amazon AWS. Mm. Like, that's going to impact a lot more people. Right. Um, so, I mean, a hybrid approach is probably good, but I think, you know, it's inevitable. I think most people just just can't support the growth and the uh, the amount of money that it takes to 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 run things in house. You know, it's just not sustainable. So, I think you just you just do the best. You just still have to do your security assessments. The uh, make sure your governance is in place. Mm -hmm. um, as a long as a long as you still take those steps, just don't assume that just moving to the cloud you get security. Mm. baked in um but yeah. it does give you it does position you for for growth for sure mm -hmm. um any anyone else want to comment on that particular point um cloud versus on-premises or... yeah yeah happy to yeah so i think if you're with one of the you know one of the major cloud providers so uh, G uh, google um, or aws or azure um and yeah it's all about how you set it up and configure it of course it is mm -hmm. um, but the, you know they have um they have very, very good um, levels of specialism and resource, far more than we could ever have um, around security. Mm. Um, so I think it's perfectly safe. And I think in a lot of sectors, um, it, this is already a debate that's been had. And the conclusion is on-prem is dying and will die. And yeah, of course, there'll be certain services that stick around for a while being run on-premise, but Mm. Um, it's largely a, a done debate. Mm -hmm. Okay. Even, even the UK government's using public cloud. Right. Yeah. Um, okay. Thank you, Gareth. Um, um, uh, great question here. Very short, but sweet. Um, do you all have a first 48 hour response template? Um, um, Alex, what, what would yours be? The answer should, for me is no. Right. And we still don't have it, and I honestly question myself if it makes sense. Oh, really? Why, why is that? I think the, the different uh, aspects of ad techs uh, are, are not comparable or are so different that maybe the, the, the response template is always different. Mm hmm OK. Is a different thing if you are a victim of a CEO fraud or if you are a victim of a ransomware attack. Yeah, so it's it's kind of impossible to have a, a one size fits all sort of template for how you respond, right? But there's generic concepts in place: what should mm -hmm. be done, who should be involved, whom you need to talk to. You mm -hmm. probably need to involve uh, communication agencies. You need to involve lawyers, official agencies. 
uh, there is a kind of uh, process in place that uh, certain departments are part of the crisis team and all the things. And this is, if you assume that as a response template, that's existing, yes. Mm -hmm. And um, Guy, do you have a 48 hour response template or is yeah, it more so complicated we, yeah. than that? No, we, we do, and, and we do have a lot of uh, processes as part of, you know, having to be SOX compliant and, and other uh, regulatory requirements. Like, we do have a process that also uh, automates the ticketing systems where it goes to, you know, Tier 1, Tier 2, and they know to contact security based on the um, uh, severity of a ticket or an outage. Um, mm -hmm. So, I, I think we have pretty strong processes and, and, and automation around that, but I think what Alex is probably alluding to is, is at the end of the day, when something actually happens, I mm. think that's when people sort of like adrenaline kicks in. And uh, so I think it's important to, I mentioned tabletop exercise. I mean, it's important to start that process and over time have different ones with different groups so that you know that people are prepared. Because at the end of the day, you can have all the processes and policies in the world. And sometimes people just go read them, say, sure, it makes sense. But, mm. you know, when... Uh, you know, when something really happens and you're in, yeah. in a stressful situation, that that's when it's really get tested, that's, right? So it's important to maybe, yes. I, yeah. I, I, we added the tabletop to that process. And I think um, hopefully over time, we'll, we'll be at the stage where the tabletop goes across all, every, everybody from, from first responders to the board level, right? Because they have to make certain decisions, you know, mm. uh, as Alex mentioned, like PR firm, Mm. Um, your 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 cyber insurance provider too. So if you have that, make sure that they're tied into that exercise. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Guy. Um, I'm going to change tack slightly, um, just to ask Gareth. Um, obviously, you've been involved with the working group at the European Rental Association, uh, the working group on cybersecurity. Um, I suppose it's a bit of a, a two pronged question. I mean, first of all, do you uh, how can you give an idea of the scale of the, the issue that the rental sector is facing? I mean, how prepared are rental companies for these kinds of issues? And uh, maybe then also just, uh, you know, give us a, a snapshot of, of the work that the ERA has been doing um, and some of the, you know, the, the, the top line challenges that um, the working group has identified. Yeah, so, well, um, on, the, uh, on the second point, um, there's a really great um incident 48 hour incident response template in the oh. era um oh, guide. There you go. <laughs> uh, going back to the previous question um yeah. with um a big credit to uh kevin price from hss on that one um mm -hmm. uh so there's there are templates and uh, all sorts of interesting uh, uh references for people within that and i think one of the um one of the conclusions that we, that we reached was it's it's good to have like an external benchmark to um, to aim at. So it doesn't really matter which you pick, whether it's CIS or or whatever. But in the UK, um, just getting going with um, looking at the Cyber Essentials Program. So a very mm -hmm. simple set of um, checks um, designed for SMEs, really. Mm -hmm. um, gives you a starting point to get moving. It gives you an action plan. And mm -hmm. you can then build up from there and um, look at a slightly higher level of accreditation, whether that's Cyber Essentials Plus or moving on even further to full ISO 27001. So being able to not do something um, which is uh, unique to you, unique to the sector, but just look at what best practice is across industry broadly. Mm -hmm. um, and those benchmarks exist um, in the UK, in the US, and and in the EU. So um, I think that's a really good a really good starting point in terms mm -hmm. of um, where should this sit in in terms of priority level. Well, cybersecurity is one of the top business continuity risks for any modern company. Mm. But do you get um, the sense that? Um... Uh, rental companies are, you say, a small, a small, independent rental company. I mean, how aware are they of the, of the threats? And you know, I mean, uh, uh, I, it's, I know it's hard to sort of measure, but um, do you get a sense of, of of how prepared most companies are? Or well, you know? um, well, so as, as a as a sector, so construction and rental are very much at the lagging end of digital transformation. 
Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, compared to say retail or, or, or um, lots of other sectors, uh, media. Um, so we, we are less um, mature, have been less mature, um, but we're rapidly, um, as, we, as we've talked about with IoT, increasing our level of exposure Mm. Um, and uh, we need to make sure that the uh, investment and uh, the focus comes ahead of an attack, mm. not just uh, relying on, um, you know, something bad's happened and now we pour money into it. Mm. So I think people need to look at it as a business continuity risk, and um, it's up there with the top um, existential threats to to rental companies. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, I've got a very practical question here. How and where can we get the first 48 hour template? I think that question may be referring to the ERA um, cybersecurity guide and and that's on the website, isn't it? In your publication uh, section. So if you go to, is it, um, I can't remember the ERA website now, but it's, if you Google European Rental Association and you go to the publications section, you should be able to find um, the guide and the templates within that. Um, I've got another question here, um, again, related to the ERA, um, or rather the ERA convention. Um, We heard the importance at the convention in the cybersecurity presentations about the importance of doing enough, but not seeking the perfect solution. Um, Do you have any comments on that in terms of, you know, something is better than perfect, you know, having having some kind of um, system in in place is better than... um, waiting to have the perfect one, which I'm sure is a, a, a pitfall for a, a lot of businesses. Um, Guy, what, what's your take on that? Yeah, I mean, obviously something is better than nothing. I, th- <laughs> I think I think you probably have to connect as a, as a group, right? From Because Garrett mentioned before, this is, a, this is a business problem, right? Like cybersecurity is a business problem. It's not just a, here's security, figure it out and, and tell us what you need. I think you got to mm-hmm. look at, at, at your specific, specific environment what is your biggest risk, right? So, so we're our crown jewel, so to speak, right? Like, wh- like if something were to go down, what's the most important data? What's the most critical for us? And at the very least, try to secure those, whether it's true. And security doesn't have to be expensive. I think that's another mm. misconception that you can do a lot of things for 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 very cheap. Um, and I think the return on on investment is is, is pretty high, right? So, ransomware is an easy one, right? Like if you can prevent mm. it. Um, mm. it you know, you're saving your company quite a lot of money and, and risk. So yeah, just, just evaluating when your riskiest assets are, maybe start there, like figure out if you have a public facing website and maybe secure that if that's your main source of revenue, right? Like put a mm-hmm. web application firewall in place um, mm-hmm. to prevent the denial of services attacks like that. That's a fairly straightforward one, right? If, you, if mm-hmm. you're a sales organization, you do a lot of email, yeah, invest in an email security solution because that if you're, your majority of your work is through email, you want to secure that first, right? Yeah. And then yeah. awareness is free, right? Like awareness training is free. So, mm. you know, f- figuring out a creative way to engage with your uh, user base to ensure that that they're safe and they're secure and they know what to do and what not to do. Because mm. um, ultimately yeah. they're your last, uh, last resort, right? Yeah. Thank you, Guy. Um, um, uh, I think we'll probably start to wrap up now, but um, do any of our panelists uh, want to add anything to this discussion that hasn't perhaps been highlighted or any sort of um, key takeaways for our audience on um, how to get started with cybersecurity or how to start thinking about it? I'll just pick up on something that Guy said, because I think that's it's a really interesting problem for us um, when we're when we're looking at uh, investments in cybersecurity and that's demonstrating ROI mm-hmm. so it's it's actually quite difficult to um, it's, it's a harder sell um, to say you're spending this amount of money to avoid a potential problem mm-hmm. um, that's why it's quite useful for us to have that banner that headline of four percent of global revenues as a as a fine under GPR, uh, GDPR, um, but it is a it is a harder case to make um, to uh, to spend money to avoid a potential problem, mm. um, and uh, there are lots of stats out there about you know this is the average cost of a 
uh, of a breach, X million, or the global cost of cybercrime is Y billion. Um, but I think we need to think creatively about, um, about how to get those business cases through. And mm. um, for me, the, um, the way that I've, I've been able to translate it into something that makes sense in our sector, wouldn't work in other sectors, is that, is that view of it as being like a health and safety problem. Mm. Mm. Um, so um, it, it then takes on a, a different guise to, um, uh, to the traditional assessment of a business case. Mm -hmm. Okay, that makes sense. And any other comments before we, before we wrap up? Um, okay, well, um, let me just check. Uh, yeah, that's great. Thank you so much um, to all, all three of you, Alex, Guy and Gareth. Um, uh, it's been a really fascinating um, insight into this huge topic. I think in a way we just uh, scratched the surface, but um, it's a great way to get the discussion going. Um, for our audience, um, just so that you're aware, we will be um, uh, including a link to a recording of this uh, webinar on the KHL and International Rental News websites in the next few days. So um, keep an eye out for those. And um, in the meantime, I just want to thank our panelists again. Thank you to our audience. Thank you uh, to our sponsors, MCS and Lawson's Global Recruitment. And uh, yes, thanks all for a very interesting uh, session and stay safe. And um, yeah, see you again sometime soon. Thank you.